Maeve uh, works for an organization called IDA Ireland. She's going to explain what that is in just a second. Uh, and she's based here in San, in San Francisco, um, Vice President for Engineering and Green Economy, a very good title, especially for this conference. Yep. Um, Dr. Byrne, I'll call you Lorraine. Lorraine it's fine. Thank you. Um, <laughs> rather than say, well, I'll say it, SFI Center for Advanced Materials and Bioengineering Research Center, Amber, what is that? So Amber is um, a material science research center. It's uh, headquartered in Trinity College, Dublin, which is in the center of the city, uh, founded in 1592 by Elizabeth I. This is very old. Um, but we're actually a consortium of material scientists across nine academic institutions in Ireland. And our core mission is to carry out fundamental and applied material science in four thematic areas, materials for information and communications technology, materials for energy, materials for health, and sustainable and the circular economy, materials for sustainability in the circular economy. And part of our role is fundamental science, but the other part is applied, and we collaborate with industry and other stakeholders to really translate that materials research into the commercial sphere. And we're going to hear a lot about exactly what you're working on, but that was a very impressive definition. It's quite a substantial institution. Trinity College is a nice, substantial place to be located also. Yeah, so Maeve, what do you do and what is IDA Ireland? Well, thank you, David, and delighted to be here. Um, first and foremost, I guess, um, who, who I am. Um, I'm an engineer by training, and I meet with companies day and daily. And one of the most exciting things for me, as I do my job, is uh, seeing how engineering and engineering talent is at the center um, of solving some of the biggest challenges we have around climate and our ambition to decarbonize our economy. I work with IDA Ireland, we are part of the Irish government and we work to uh, support companies to set up in Ireland and to scale from Ireland. So some of the companies that you heard from today are investors in Ireland, Autodesk, um, Salesforce, um, VMware, UCT are all recent investors into Ireland. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's great because, well, we, we, you're a partner of ours, and yep. we, we knew we were going to be working with you, but I was so delighted when we started talking, mm -hmm. and you said, what I really want to talk about is the importance of sustainability, yes. and how the companies that come to us, yes. that is what they want help with. So talk a little bit about that. So whenever you engage with companies in my role, um, you know, for decades, the same sort of drivers always come up, and we probably could name them. You know, can I get access to market? Can I get access to talent? Is it a competitive location? And Ireland absolutely is in the heart of the European Union. It's a full member. It's about 50 years coming up in January 2023. 20, uh, but over the past number of years, um, let's say two years, increasingly existing companies that have invested in Ireland and companies that were looking to invest in Ireland are increasingly saying to us, you know, climate is becoming a higher priority for them. And they're saying to us, how can Ireland support us in our climate agenda? And it's normally twofold, really. They're looking at how can Ireland help them decarbonize their operations? Because they, at a corporate level, have goals and targets that they need to kind of like achieve. And then how can Ireland or any location for that matter, support them develop products and services that addresses the climate and the sustainability agenda. And it's quite striking um, that, that that is becoming, you know, I would say it's in the top 10, if not the top five areas of kind of like, that they want real evidence and support of how we can, how Ireland can support them in, along that theme of climate. And I guess, Malta speaks English, right? But but you're really the only English-speaking yes. big country in the EU now. Yes, right? we are. In the 27, we are the only English-speaking country. So for yes. an American com company that wants... Because EU is doing a lot of things differently when it comes to sustainability and climate, both legally I mean, and, and regulatorily and in terms of funding. You know, yes. maybe you should just quickly say, well, what is the EU Green Deal, for example? Uh, absolutely. So, for, for, so, you know, at the very start, it really starts with uh, Europe and Ireland uh, putting a framework in place um, that, allows, um, comp that, that allows for innovation. And the, the, the framework really consists of legislation and then a, a budget, which is basically EU Green Deal. And the legislation is there to provide focus um, and to provide a, a direction for action 
around innovation. And it also reflects you know, the high standards that the EU consumer actually demands of both um, companies and of their governments. They want solutions that address the sustainability agenda. Yeah. Um, the EU Green Deal, and that, is, that legislation is underpinned by the EU, EU Green Deal, which is basically leveraging one uh, trillion euros to help kind of look with the energy transition around things like sustainable mobility, renewable energy, just transition, climate mitigation. So, you know, eight countries, for example, in the, in the Baltic area have come together to increase their offshore um, uh, energy generation by 20 gigawatts by 2030. And that really is underpinned by the European Union. The European Union being a catalyst for investment and innovation all around the, their goal to become carbon neutral by 2050. Well, you brought along one of the great research scientists of the EU, and, and we want to get to some detail about what Lorraine is doing. Yeah. But one of the things I thought was really interesting that you said was that American companies recognizing that sustainability requirements and regulation is going to come at them, find it interesting and advantageous to go to Ireland and start finding out what it's like to operate in a place where those kinds of regulations are already in place. Well, if they want to succeed in Europe, which is like you know, a population of 450 million, very sophisticated, very wealthy economic bloc, then they, ha they have to be in Europe and being, part, being in Ireland and having the support of you know, research institutes like Amber allows them to develop products and services that addresses the need of the European consumer. Right. But being in a place where there's already a, a more green mentality, both from Absolutely. the point of view yeah. of the consumers, but also the regulatory environment. In a way, it's like an early look into what we certainly hope will happen here in the near future. So I've had companies speak to me uh, and say that they are US companies, um, and they have said to me that they need to be in Europe for certain products in the energy market, because that is where the innovation is actually happening. Yeah. That's where they're going to develop the new products and services that may well come back into this market, I don't know. But if they want to be at the forefront, they want to be in Ireland so that they can be in Europe. Yeah, and, and Lorraine, I know you work on a lot of different things. In fact, it's amazing all the things that you're involved with. Uh, but a lot of them have to do with sustainability. Talk about maybe some of the projects that your institute has worked on. Sure, so, so sustainability is increasingly pervasive through all of our themes. Mm -hmm. So, um, and we heard a lot this today about batteries, about the steel industry, about the physical infrastructure that's needed for Meta, the metaverse. Mm -hmm. um, so the first thing I'll say about material science is I read a, a scary statistic that said 50% of all greenhouse gas emissions and over 90% of biodiversity loss globally is due to the extraction and processing of materials. Wow. So there's an impetus on material science to try and mitigate that. So on the, the circular economy is a massive part of what we do, um, working on how do you develop high performance materials from waste. Um, so we have a very large program around plastics. I know you're going to talk about plastics tomorrow. Um, about, at the moment, if you mechanically recycle PET, which is the most prevalent plastic in packaging today, it's not that great. It's kind of, it's, 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 it's a poor um, reflection of what it was originally. It's so not easy to really it's make not it really into the same yeah, thing again. Absolutely, it's hard to use it in medical device packaging, it's hard to use it in food packaging, it's, it's not that great. So what we're doing in Amber is we're developing novel catalysts, um, novel chemical and biological uh, depolymerization technology that takes the PET and brings it right back down to the base monomer, and then you can repolymerize it to almost well, the same PET as you would have had if you had virgin PET. So we're working with, with some a very large beverage company, a US you beverage can't company. Say the name. I was uh, gonna... We're working with PepsiCo. Oh, PepsiCo, yeah. Uh, on um, on their they have a program called PepsiCo Plus or PepsiCo Positive, and we're working with them on three projects looking at this whole recyclable, P, recyclable PET. Um, so we have three projects: one on depolymerization de of PET, one on using waste from orange peel and potatoes to extract something that will act as a PET precursor, um, and one on pulp, pulp bottles, um, making, making bottles from, from wood products. So it's quite, quite diverse. Um, on the battery side, yeah. and we talked a lot about batteries today, um, we, we're originally, our origins are nanoscience. 
Um, and so we have a lot of work going on on the battery electrodes themselves and integrating nanomaterials, which are very tiny materials, um, into, the, into the battery electrodes, which first of all in, um, improve the capacitance of the battery. They've got much higher surface area, they have much more charging and decharging um, capability. Um, but also we found that if you integrate things like these, these nanomaterials called carbon nanotubes into the battery, it, it acts as a dampening effect to stop the extraction and, and contraction of the battery as it charges, which is what causes batteries to fail over time. It's a mechanical stress. So we're, we're working a lot with the mobile phone companies. We have worked in the past with Nokia Bell Labs. Um, we're currently working with some of the European automotive manufacturers, including Daimler, in a very large European project mm. on EV. Um, and it's, it's increasingly a big area for us. Mm. And the final area I'll talk about, which is really close to my heart, is, is, is information and communications technology. Um, and today, computer chips work the same way as they've worked since the 40s. So there was a, a scientist called von Neumann who developed um, this technology of decoupling memory and logic in computers. Um, that causes a lot of energy because you're shuttling electrons back and forward. And Stacking it is a material science problem because once you lock in the logic, you're very limited on what you can put on top of it. So we're developing high-performance semiconductor materials that will enable you to vertically stack memory and That's logic. That's for systems on a chip. Yeah, kind of. systems on, well actually, yeah, systems on a chip, but how, with a view to reducing the energy consumption of your chips, which will reduce the energy consumption of your servers, which overall will in reduce the energy consumption of your infrastructure. So it's wow, so, a lot. So like, and there's plenty more she could say that she hasn't <laughs> even gotten to yet. So like Amber would be an example of a number of, we've got a number of different research centers. Right, from talk about a, the other institutes. Yeah, we've got one that like renew, Renewable Energy, Mari, we've got like data analytics centers, we've got AI centers. Um, and that, that, it's an example of, we've got an advanced manufacturing center uh, because we've got a, quite a sophisticated like advanced manufacturing um, kind of sector in our Ireland in, in a, kind of like pharma and like a bio, biomedicine um, and so it's an example of amber is an example of the the collaborative approach that Ireland takes to innovation so you sit with the, in Europe with the, 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 the goal and Ireland has legislated around it's got you know a binding targets around you know, meeting becoming carbon neutral by 2050 and 51% reduction in our carbon by 2030 80% of our electricity um, from renewable sources by 2030 really that's Ireland that is Ireland as yeah, a country as yeah. a country so the big challenge now for Ireland is to exploit um, off our, our wind energy which is our natural resource um, and so, so a lot of our companies, our investing companies, are actually leveraging our, Ireland's wind resource to decarbonise their operations. And we've got a, a marine landmass off the, the, the west coast of Ireland, which is about 10 times the size of Ireland. And if, as and when we kind of like that becomes operational, the opportunity there is for Ireland to become energy secure and then perhaps even to export energy. You mean, you mean a marine, it's like, Close to the surface, but it's underwater. Is that what it, a marine it, land mass is? It's the, it's the, the, it's the land. It's the so land you can is. put a lot of wind power on there, for example. Absolutely. Yeah. So the goal, um, uh, when, when last stated, is like seven gigawatts by 2030. So we're wow. in, that's all in train and by you know, 20 gigawatts by 2050. Um, and so the collaborative approach really that Lorraine represents on the academ uh, uh, academic side is that she works closely with industry within a framework that you know, government provides. So it's really a relationship between government, industry and academia to solve some of the challenges that our citizens in Europe and beyond actually want resolved. Really interesting. Mm -hmm. So uh, if anybody has questions, I want to hear them. But Lorraine, um, I'm curious if, if you heard Mike Schrepfer this morning. Yes, it is. And also the Lucid, you know, talk was yeah. pretty relevant, I'd say. I just wonder if you have any observations, uh, particularly about Mike's point about, you know, scaling up the speed of physical infrastructure <laughs> development. Did that resonate with you? It did, yes. Um, the question I had for Mike afterwards was, in addition to scaling up 
the infrastructure, you have to think about the life cycle of the infrastructure. And I think you need to bake that in very early so that you don't end up with all this infrastructure that's obsolete in 10 years and taking right. up, sucking up energy. Taking So I think it's really important that you do that um, because otherwise, like in Ireland in particular, um, there's a lot of data centers and, and there's now a, you know, there's a concern about we the proliferation of data centers in Ireland. So you have to think about the energy consumption of those data centers the modularization of those data centers that you can upgrade them as new technologies come on stream. And so I, I think it's, Mike's point was very relevant. But Did you talk to yeah, him Yeah, so I talked to him afterwards, yeah. yeah and he said he hadn't really thought, thought about the circular aspect of the infrastructure, but I think it's something that's Oh, important. so that was good you did. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, and, and you, you know, one of the things that he talked about was um, reinforcing the existing electrical infrastructure. And yes. you have this company, Smart Wires, that you were yes, telling me about. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so there's a US company, actually. And they have a technology that was um, built out in Georgia Tech. And it basically, it, it, they deploy it on the transmission lines. And it balances the load on the transmission lines. Because what he was pointing to, what Mike was pointing to, was this kind of like resistance to building out um, more grid infrastructure. And smart wires uh, technology is there to kind of to, to utilize the grid infrastructure that we absolutely have to its its maximum. But we already have. But that we already build, have. Yeah. We're having to build new because yeah. you know there is resistance you know across the Western world to building yeah. out new green, um, yeah. um, kind of like grid infrastructure. What I thought was interesting about what Mike said was you know there was a regulatory hack where he could you know you can. Put in new kind of like metals into the transmission line, and that wouldn't that would get around the regulatory um, demands. I'm not sure how well that w might actually work in practice, but you know, that's something. That's something but that now I forget which one of you was telling me about the um, superconducting materials yeah. that were being also yeah. used in the existing infrastructure. Yeah, so we're we're, we're working with an Irish company called Supernode. Um, right. who have this vision of creating a European supergrid for offshore wind. So that rather than trying to store energy coming off offshore wind and batteries, that you just distribute it to where it ne it's needed. And so we're working on superconducting subsea cables. Um, but unlike Mike, who, who talked about higher temperature superconductors, we're working on the, because superconductors have to keep very cold, uh, on the cryostat material to insulate the superconductors to keep them cold. Right. So um, we're, we're using a slightly different approach with existing technology, but um, that's also something, and that doesn't come into some of the upgrade of the existing network mm -hmm. we have because offshore wind is new. It'll be, It'll new be a new system entirely. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it may be slightly easier from a regulatory point of view. Yeah. So those tur wind turbines off the coast, the west, western coast of Ireland yeah. will end up feeding electricity all the way to mainland Europe, yes. most likely. Yes, absolutely. We have, a, we, have a, we have an interconnector being built out at the moment between Ireland and France. Uh -huh. It'll bypass the UK entirely. They're not part of you anymore. <laughs> well, you might I'm want sorry. to. <laughs> there, are, there are interconnectors with the UK as well. But this is a new one that we're building um, between the south of Ireland and into France. I think it's something like 800 megawatts or whatever. But you know, in time, we probably will need more. It's amazing all the things that are happening, particularly with wind in Europe right now. I mean, yeah. even since the invasion of Ukraine, that has been substantially beefed up, wouldn't you say? Well, it's kind of, it's, it's focused attention, it's focused action. And it's accelerated perhaps some of the ambitious plans that Europe yeah. has. So I pointed to earlier about the, the Baltic states, 20 gigawatts off, right. uh, offshore wind to generate you know, more energy by 2030. And that maybe kind of like is interrelated in some way. Yeah. Um, anybody have a question they want to throw out there? Um, but you know, talk a little bit about how, you know, Obviously, what you hope for is that American companies are going to come to Ireland and do more. Talk about what you can do with them if they do that. I mean, because you have these amazing institutes, but IDA really does have some very creative ways of creating these multi-sectoral, multidisciplinary pro projects to really help the process along. Yeah, so like examples that we would have, um, you know, a lot of the tech companies actually um, are uh, like Meta, Amazon, Microsoft are all doing really interesting things in Ireland uh, because of our dependence and our increasing dependence on renewable energy. We all know that that's variable and that provides a, an excellent test bed for some of these tech companies to be able to trial new technologies and around kind of like sustaining their kind of like their energy kind of um, ensuring that their energy is 
is kind of like consistent and robust. So there's some interesting projects going on there. Um, and also we have an emerging um, green mobility cluster as well, where we have like the likes of Vallejo, we've got General Motors, we've got Aptiv, um, and we've got uh, Jaguar Land Rover, who um, was mentioned earlier by Waymo. Um, the software to manage the electrification of their vehicles actually happens uh, happens in Ireland. So that's the type of thing that we can broker um, you, uh, if companies are you know are interested in exploring this new kind of um, emerging sustainable economy that's um, kind of like roaring in in Europe. So you become a little bit like a consultant to them on how to best maximize their presence if, Certainly, they, if they come to Ireland. So we wouldn't necessarily call ourselves consultants. We've been around for about 70 years, and we know the ecosystem incredibly well. So we can short circuit and make things happen at a much more rapid pace right. than someone who doesn't know the ecosystem, the Irish and the European ecosystem as well. Lorraine, was there anything that you wanted to say in this panel that we didn't get to? Um, and I would say that our, you, you said Ireland was a big country. It's a small country. Um, and that's a real advantage. We have a small country advantage, so we're, we're very well interconnected. So there's, there's 16 centers, SFI centers in different fields, mm -hmm. which, which means that if a company comes and wants to do something that's a little bit transdisciplinary, um, it's very easy to put and assemble a group of scientists together to solve that problem. We have that innate ability to bring people together quite quickly, which you might not have in a very large country where it's separated by hundreds of miles. Are any of those mm. other institutes right at Trinity College there's, also? Uh, there's three centres in Trinity, um, Amber, which is material science one, there's one in network technology, um, working on 5G, um, and there's one on um, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Wow. Well, really interesting, a pleasure to have you up here and thank you for being a partner and doing such interesting and important work. Okay, thank you very much, David. <clears throat>